Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mikaela Pulmenopoulou. I am from the I'm scientific officer at the European Research Council Executive Agency. And today I would like to present the ERC and its funding opportunities. I will start my presentation by uh, talking about the mission of the ERC, that is to encourage the highest quality research in Europe through competitive funding and to support investigator-driven frontier research across all fields of research uh, on the basis of scientific excellence. So already from the mission, you can see uh, that the ERC supports highest quality research in all fields and with the only criteria, the scientific excellence. So we understand that the ERC is a funding agency and as a funding agency is part of the Horizon Europe uh, Research and Innovation Program. Uh, for 2021 to 2027, the budget for ERC is 16 billion that represents the 70% of the entire Horizon Europe budget. Before this, uh, before Horizon Europe, the ERC was part of Horizon 2020 and before part of the FP7, as you can see here in the bubbles. But ERC is also the scientific council that, uh, that are 22 prominent researchers that are appointed by the European Commission, and you can see here their pictures. And one of uh, the 22 is the president, uh, that is now Professor Maria Leptin, that you can see here on the top, and below the three pictures of the vice presidents for the three different domains, social science and humanities, physical science and engineering, and life sciences. And the rest are the members of the scientific council. The Scientific Council establishes the overall scientific strategy, controls the quality of operations and management, and uh, uh, very importantly, uh, ensures communication with the scientific community. The Scientific Council is also responsible for appointing the panel members that take uh, part in the evaluation and evaluate the proposals. The panel members act independently during the evaluation process. The ERC is also the executive agency. You can see here our premises in Brussels, where the executive agency is responsible for implementing the call for proposals, for organizing peer review evaluation, for establishing and, management, and managing the grant agreements, for all the scientific and financial aspects of uh, the running grants, and also carries out communication activities like this one with uh, grantees. Uh, the scientific officers now, like I am, uh, we are not evaluators, but we work closely uh, with the panel members that take part in the evaluation. We manage all the practical aspects of the evaluations, and we also carry out scientific follow-up of the running projects. So the basic characteristics of the ERC uh, and its funding is that we have long-term grants, usually, as we will see, uh, up to five years. Uh, individual researchers from all over the world, they can apply. It can be at any field of research, completely bottom up. And what the, the panel members are looking is actually the high risk, high gain uh, aspects of the projects. And the only criteria, as we said, is the excellence. So now to go a little bit in more detail to the different schemes that we have. For individual researchers, there are three main schemes. These are the starting grant, the consolidator grant, and advanced grant. Uh, the difference uh, for an applicant to apply, it has to do with how many years after the acquisition of the PhD the applicant is. So for example, to apply for a starting grant, uh, the applicant should be two to seven years uh, after the completion of their PhD. For consolidator grant, this is seven to 12 years after the completion of the PhD, while for advanced grant, the applicant should have an excellent scientific track record of recognized scientific achievements the last 10 years. You can see that all the individual grants are up to five years. There is also a difference on the size of the grant. For starting, it can be up to 1.5 million, for consolidator can be up to 2 million, and for advanced grant can be up to 2.5 million. There is also the, uh, the opportunity to ask for additional budget, as you will see, for all of these grants up to 1 million, that I will explain later, in which cases this can be requested. In addition to these individual schemes, there is also one scheme that's called Synergy Grant, where not one, but two to four researchers can apply for this type of grant. 
And also one of the researches can be based outside the EU or an associated country. The size for this grant is up to 10 million and the duration is up to six years. And also the additional funding that can be requested for the synergy grant is up to 4 million. And then there is another type of grant, the proof of concept grant, that is a small size uh, grant of 150,000 euro and with duration up to 18 months. And this is uh, for this to apply are eligible only already ERC grantees. And the idea is uh, to use the proof of concept uh, grant to demonstrate that the idea funded by the original ERC grant has innov innovation potential and significant economic or societal benefit. Now, but the reasons that an applicant can request for additional budget, uh, this extra 1 million that we said for starting consolidator and advanced, uh, here you can see uh, the different reasons. One can be the startup costs for principal investigators moving to the EU or an associated country from uh, another place because they receive the ERC grant. It is also about the purchase of major equipment or access to large facilities or other major experimental and field work costs, but not personal costs. So uh, this uh, about the, the reasons for additional budget, you can find it in the work program. It's here, this year in the 2022 work program of the ERC that you can find in our website is in page 17. So as we said, everyone can apply. So independent researchers of any nationality, any age, but as I said, it has to be two years after the completion of the PhD for the starting grant, and any current working place in the world can apply. But there is a requirement that the, the applicant should have at the time of the application, a host institution letter from an institute in an EU or an associated country. So the applicant doesn't need to be in the EU when uh, applies, but if he or she receives the grant, uh, will execute the grant in, in the EU or an associated country. So as, as we said, PIs from all over the world can apply and uh, some of extra opportunities that are given to the people uh, that are not in the EU and an associated countries are as already mentioned is this additional startup funding that they can request up to 1 million for individual schemes. Uh, the grantees can keep also the affiliation in their home country uh, that is outside Europe, but significant part of their working time should be in Europe, at least 50%. And this is checked during the execution of the project. Some team members can be based outside the Europe and the, uh, all the grants are portable. So they can be uh, moved with the, uh, uh, with the PI inside the Europe or an associated country. So here we have the calendar for the 2022 calls. All the calls except of the POC grants are now closed. Uh, yesterday also the advanced grant call closed. So we go to the 2023 uh, dates. Here you can see the dates for the different calls starting consolidator advanced, synergy and also proof of concept. These dates are indicative, uh, are to be confirmed, but the, the actual dates will be announced in our ARC website. It's very likely that it will be uh, these or very close to these dates, but for more updated information, better consult our website. So the ERC panel structure uh, is the one that you see in the screen. We have three different domains, life sciences, social science and humanities, and physical science and engineering. Uh, in bold, you can see here the P6 panel that is more relevant for this conference, computer science and informatics. And in red, you can see the P11 and SH7 uh, panel, but they are red because they were introduced in 2021. So they are new. This is the second year that this panel, uh, uh, that, that we have this panel. So in total, we have three domains and 27 panels that are operated by the scientific department of the ERC executive agency. Each of these panels consists of the panel chair and the panel members that are 14 to 17 panel members for each of the panel. And these are the ones that uh, they do the peer review evaluation of the proposals. So uh, inside each panel, there are uh, descriptors 
Uh, here you can see the computer science and informatics descriptors. These are descriptors that the applicant selects when applies for an ERC grant. Here you can see the PC extend is web and information systems. Uh, but uh, many applicants, they use a combination sometimes of descriptors that better describe their project. So now I would like to, to go a little bit uh, in more detail of how is the evaluation process. And uh, the reason is uh, that it's very important for the applicant to be aware of how is the evaluation process because uh, it gives a better idea of how to, to structure the different documents uh, that the applicant should apply. Because it's a single submission for the applicant, but a two-step evaluation for the ERC. So at step one, it is important to know that the panel members, they see only what we call section one, the part V1. This is the synopsis and the CV of the PI. So they assess only the part V1. And after doing the remote evaluation, they come to Brussels for an on-site or online meeting during the pandemic, uh, where they discuss all the proposals. And as a result of this uh, meeting, they select the proposals to be rejected with score B or C, and then the applicants, of course, they get feedback, and they also decide about the proposals to be retained for step two. For the proposals that are retained and go to step two, uh, this will be evaluated by the panel members, but also by remote reviewers. The remote reviewers are nominated by the panel members during the step one panel meeting, and during the remote evaluation at step two, both the panel members and the remote reviewers read the whole proposal, the part B1 and part B2, full proposal plus the resources. So then after the evaluation, the remote evaluation, comes the second uh, panel meeting uh, in Brussels, uh, usually, or remote in case uh, of the pandemic. And uh, also, at this stage, we have the interviews of the PIs. Before it was for starting and consolidator grant, but from last year also advanced grant applicants, uh, they take place uh, interviews uh, and they have a part for their presentation and also a QA and a with the panel. So after uh, this panel meeting, uh, result the ranked list of proposals. So we have A proposals that they are inside the budget and they go for immediate funding and a proposal that are outside the budget and they might be funded if more funds becomes available uh, and the B proposals that are not funded proposals. Also, uh, as we said, the ERC uh, funds frontier research but also uh, funds applied research. Also something to know is that the budget among the panels is distributed as a function of demand. Uh, the panel descriptors do not represent ERC scientific priorities. They are used only uh, to be able to do, uh, to better uh, manage the evaluation process. So we use descriptors, but these are not priorities. Also, another important thing to consider is that what we see from the statistics, uh, the success rate is virtually flat across the eligibility window for starting and consolidator grant. So we don't see actually that if someone is uh, closer to the end of the eligibility window, that uh, he or she has more chances. So it is advisable that the applicants try uh, early. So in case uh, of rejection, to be able to reapply for the same time of type of grant. And also the host institution uh, is required uh, during the application, but is not an evaluation criterion. And as I said before, the excellence is the sole evaluation criteria. And the excellence is at two steps, is for the research project, so the groundbreaking nature, the potential impact of the project and the scientific approach are evaluated, uh, while for the PI, the intellectual capacity, the creativity, and the commitment to the project. So what do you need to submit uh, an ERC research proposal? Of course, you need uh, a bright and original idea, and then you need to design a research project to implement this idea. You certainly need a letter of support from a host institution uh, that should be based in EU or an associated country. And an important thing is to select the right panel. 
The selection of the panel uh, is done at the submission stage by the applicant and uh, the proposal is evaluated to the originally selected panel. There are some cases in case of uh, clear error uh, that the proposal might be evaluated by another panel if uh, fits better. Uh, but it is very important that you do the right selection of the uh, main panel. Also, if your proposal you think that is interdisciplinary, you can select a secondary panel, but it's important in this case to explain this interdisciplinary nature. Also, you need to select descriptors and keywords that characterize the best way uh, your proposal, uh, because this will help in the evaluation process. And then, of course, you need to write the research proposal and submit it electronically. And it is highly advisable to do early registration and submission uh, before the deadline. Some tips now, if you are invited for an interview, uh, you need to try to get panel members interested in you and your project. Uh, the panel, especially for starting and consolidator, wants to see that the ideas that you present are yours and not these of your supervisor. Don't try to guess who is in the panel because the panels are renewed. Uh, so it's a waste of time. It is better to practice thoroughly, practice with colleagues uh, and uh, try uh, to think of possible questions and be ready to answer their questions. And of course, it is normal to be nervous during the interview. Here you see some statistics about the countries of host institution. Uh, for the different schemes, you can see here we have uh, many countries, UK, Germany, France, Netherlands are uh, the first in the list. And here you can see uh, uh, PIs that are uh, outside with a nationality, uh, non-EU or associated country nationality, that are over 80% of all the ERC grants, that their principal investigators are not uh, with a nationality from European Union or an associated country. And you can see here also uh, some of these countries. And with this, I would like to go also to the opportunities that are given for people that are outside the EU and associated countries, uh, international researchers that they would like to visit an ERC team. The, the ERC since 2012 implements a, a program, an international program called Implementing Arrangements, uh, and this is to promote opportunity for scientists to visit and collaborate with ERC research teams that are far, partially supported by non-European agencies. Here you can see in, uh, in this slide uh, the different countries that participate already since 2012 uh, to this program. You can see there are countries like Canada, USA, Mexico, uh, Singapore, India, Japan, uh, China, Korea. Uh, and, the, and in this bubbles, you can see the dates uh, that they joined. From each country, there is more than one uh, funding agency that can join. So this is a reason, for example, here in Japan, you see three different dates. Uh, so in 2020, uh, Japan and India joined. Uh, in total, there are 16 uh, implementing arrangements with funding agencies from 12 different countries. And in total, more than 500 researchers uh, have visited an ERC project since 2012. Here you can see also uh, in detail from the different countries, the different agencies that have joined. For more information uh, on this, you can also uh, consult our website uh, under funding and additional opportunities international, where for each of these funding agencies, you can see also uh, the eligibility criteria to, to apply, uh, because this differs according to, to its uh, national funding agency. So the main process uh, for, for uh, implementing this uh, research visit, uh, you can see in this slide. So the process starts from the ERC that launches a call for expression of interest. And this is sent to all the PIs that are eligible. And this is to all PIs, but they have uh, at least 18 more months to their grant. So principal investigators, they receive this uh, and they express their interest for hosting one or more uh, researchers from abroad. 
the ERC sends the list, this list of interested PIs to the national funding agencies. And then the national funding agency launches a call of proposals to their eligible scientists. So then the visiting scientist can contact the ERCPI and try to seek an agreement for a possible research visit. If the principal investigator uh, accepts, if uh, they decide for a research visit, then the principal investigator of the ERC grant uh, provides a host institution letter of support. All this information is evaluated by the national based funding agency and the successful ones can implement the research visit according to the agreement with the principal investigator. So this is the whole process. There are uh, slight differences to the part implemented by the national based funding agency. You can see, as I said, information uh, in our website for each of these agencies. Uh, but what is common to all agreements, actually, is that the ERC does not intervene in the communication between the PIs and the potential visitors. The selection of the visiting scientists is done by its non-EU funding agency without any intervention of the ERC. The visit, of course, should take place uh, during the lifetime of the ERC project, and uh, it is expected that the collaboration that will occur uh, during this visit, it will be for a subject that is similar uh, to the one of the topic of the grant and uh, also of mutual interest for both researchers, the PI and the visiting researcher. And the visiting researchers may be incorporated into the research team of the ERC funded uh, PIs for the duration of the visit. Uh, Normally, these visits can last for a few months to one year, sometimes around six months or uh, 12 months, but it can also be uh, smaller visits and uh, more times during, uh, during a year. Here you can see the PIs that participated from 2012 to 2021. Uh, so you can see how many PIs expressed interest to, to host a scientist from a different uh, funding agency or different country. Uh, you can see that some of these uh, are double, like the Republic of Korea. And also, if I remember correctly, is Japan. And the reason is, for example, for Republic of Korea, because they have two uh, different uh, kinds of uh, grants that they can, it can be for researchers, but it can be also for PhD students. And here you can see the actual implemented visits to, visits to ERC projects from 2012 to 20, 2020. Uh, you can see that after 2019, uh, there are less visits because this program was impacted by the COVID. Uh, but many of the visits that were planned and uh, were not implemented due to COVID, uh, they will start in 2022. And here you can see the destination countries of visiting researchers during these years. Uh, and you can see that they, they have visited in different domains, physical science and engineering, uh, life science, social science, synergy, all type of uh, uh, grants on different domains you have in this uh, graph. And as I said, uh, this uh, call of expression of interest starts, starts from the ERC. Uh, that is sent to the PIs, and this is usually done around October and November. Uh, so also this year is expected uh, to start uh, this expression of interest in October or November of 2022. As I said before, more information you can find in our website. And uh, also I would like to mention that there are some videos in our website uh, made by ESOs uh, and about to, to, to help you for um, creating an application, uh, like what to consider before applying, how to fill in an application about the interview and how the evaluation works that might help you if you are interested to apply. And of course, here are other uh, ways of uh, looking for news about the ERC and another important information, and you can find the complete list of the national contact, contact points that exist in different countries and they can provide uh, support uh, and help you and during the process of applying for an ERC. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce, I would like to stop sharing. And uh, I'm very happy that today we have with us 
uh, three, sp the three speakers, and I will start with the first one, that is Professor Marlon Dumas, uh, that he is Professor of Information Systems at University of Tartu uh, in Estonia. Uh, uh, Professor Marlon Dumas uh, was panel member in the ERC uh, in the study grant panel, and uh, he, also, uh, he also was a panel chair uh, of ERC study grant panel, and he is also an advanced grant uh, guarantee himself of the project with acronym PIX. I would like to thank him very much for being here with us, and uh, I leave the floor to him to, to present us his experience. Okay, thank you very much. Let me know if you hear me and if you see my screen. Yes, everything is fine. Everything is fine, so let me proceed. So I'm Professor of Information Systems at the University of Tartu in Estonia. Uh, where I have been working for like about 14 years. Prior to that, I was in Australia, um, you know, for many years as well. And uh, a, I, um, I was, as uh, Michaela just mentioned, um, a chair of the PE6 panel, that's Informatics and Computer Sciences, a, for a couple of times in 2018 and 2020. So I'm no longer having that role, you know, in the ERC, panel members keep uh, uh, rotating, you know, there's, they get reused for a few years, but then they rotate out and there are new panels that come, on, come into play, new panel members that come into play. Um, and uh, I, I hold an ERC advanced grantee in the field of, my field of research, which is business process management. It's a bit of a multidisciplinary research, half IT or two thirds IT, one third business. And uh, so, uh, which is a little bit of a plus when you apply for an ERC grant, but there are also uh, a lot of applicants that are, let's say, mono uh, disciplinary and they are also very successful in the ERC. So there is room for everybody. So disclaimer, despite the fact that I have been an ERC panel member, the views I present today have nothing to do with the a ERC and are just my own personal views on how you should approach an application for an ERC grant. So as a panel member, so if I can summarize my experience, what are we looking for in one sentence, right? So we get a lot of flowers, I think, like uh, who apply and it's kind of very difficult to select a subset of them. You know, everybody who applies has a, a strong publication track record relative to their career. You know, pretty much, more or less everybody. Um, all of them can be said are successful professional researchers uh, at their career stage and uh, who have made a number of uh, uh, great contributions to the, you know, valuable contributions to their field. And what we need is to what we try is to spot from there those people for which we can make the following statements. So in the case of a starting grant, we are looking for those highly promising early career researchers, you know, who in 10 years time are going to make a difference in the research field. So one of the, the tests that we, one of the, in the discussions in the panels, one of the tests that come into play is the following. So, you know, you are a, 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 you're a good researcher, no doubt, when you apply for an ERC, usually you think you are a good researcher and you probably are. And we want to, we can see it this way. If we give to you this ERC grant now, yeah, and we look at your career, say, in 10 to 20 years time, where would you be? Yeah. And then we see, where would you be if we didn't give you? the grant, right? What would you do? So we try to reason in terms of that. And then we, we come up with like, okay, you know, you are uh, someone to whom this grant will make a big difference in terms of producing high impact research in a, in a very long time frame. And those are the people we want to, to look. So people who have, who are visionary, highly promising early career researchers and who could get very far if we give this boost to their career. So for consolidators grants, if I can summarize it in one sentence, it's more about being 
on your way to building up a top level group. So you have shown that not only you have a research vision, you know, but you can assemble a group, you know, a small group around it. And if we give you the boost, you will have a top level research group, you know, with the capacity of producing research at the top of their field. And in the case of the advanced grants, I imagine what we are looking is for uh, funding world leading researchers with highly ambitious research agendas, you know, that could uh, make an impact that can be uh, uh, both in the research field and or perhaps uh, in, 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 uh, in practice as well. So, oh, let me dig a little bit more into details. And now I'm gonna be uh, focusing more on the starting people, right? Because I cannot comment on all three of them in the same presentation. Let me try to focus on how um, we will look at a specifically a starting grant uh, applicant uh, in terms of their track record and in terms of their research proposal, because those are the two things we're looking, track record and research proposal. So the first thing, of course, it is that your publication record we can state that it is of high scientific quality. And two things, two keywords we are looking at your publication record. One is some form of coherence. So it shows that you are driven by a certain vision of your field, uh, that you are going somewhere and ambitious, that you are going somewhere far. So, so that you, you spend time tackling um, a challenging problems with strong uh, potential impact. Um, we expect naturally because of that, that you publish in top conferences and journals, and we let your community define what is top. So, so we, we, we try to refer to where the top people in your field work. So where do they publish? Do you publish there? That's the kind of question we are asking ourselves. So you are in a certain research field, for example, we're in the web conference. So you might be in web information retrieval, for example. And we're gonna try to see who are considered to be the top researchers in web information retrieval. Where do they publish? Well, we'll expect you to publish there, for example. Now, whether you have published 10 papers, 15, 30 papers, and I'm talking about early career researchers, that is less relevant. We rather try to look at your top five slash top six uh, uh, publications, which you have to mention yourself, I think the top five. Uh, and that is what, in our opinion, says a lot about you, about your coherence, about your uh, a, you know, desire to conduct ambitious research. Uh, we, um, we, it is, it is a bonus if your impact is multifaceted. So uh, certainly well-cited publication is the first, is one of the things we think about when we talk about impact in research, you know, but if you can actually make another, mention something else, that is really great, yeah? So. So for example, I, I, I still remember this security researcher who had found um, X amount of high, um, highly critical security vulnerabilities and posted them in this CERT database, which is where security researchers post their exploits or vulnerabilities or you know, hackers and security researchers. So that shows not only great, you publish in, in very good, uh, venues in the field of information security or computer security or network security, but you also, you know, can make an impact in a different way this time into practice. Um, uh, so any evidence of practical impact, any evidence uh, of, uh, you know, commercial transfers are a plus, et cetera, uh, they are very, very welcome. Uh, Citations, of course, as I mentioned before, is, a, is a, um, a form of internal, let's say, research community impact measurement. Uh, 
it's not the only one. So we do expect to see a reasonable number of citations. If the number of citations is low, there are question marks about like, why is it that your advancement or your groundbreaking results are not being recognized? Um, we try to find an explanation for it, but we will be looking for such an explanation, yeah? This time we said beyond a reasonable threshold, um, which I will say, for example, in the field of, for example, web technologies, be it semantic web, web information retrieval, uh, web data management, uh, um, et cetera, the fields you will find in the web conference, I would think is maybe somewhere around for a, a, a researcher with five years of postdoctoral experience, somewhere above 500 citations, beyond such a threshold, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's just a matter like, yeah, you have demonstrated that your publications are recognized, yeah. Um, what is more important than above a given threshold, you have like a, a citation threshold that puts you among, you know, the, the, the good researchers, young researchers in your field. What is more important to us is the notable citations to your research. And that is worth citing. You know, like you uh, publish something and that something was used for to build somewhere, something else that had a strong impact. You know, you were cited by these other research teams that developed something else on top of what you did. So, so if people have built on top of what you have done, highlighted, that's the kind of impact that we are trying to, to look for. We value, as I said, the multifaceted kind of uh, impact. We value applicants who have contributed to open source tools in a, in a significant way and in a way that is related to the research or to other reusable artifacts. Um, for example, a security researcher having found highly non-trivial vulnerabilities on real systems. Uh, we usually pay attention to recognitions. So doctoral thesis award, best paper awards, or any talks in some reputable conferences and or workshops next to reputable conferences are a big bonus. Um, and, and then in your track record, for a starting grant, we are looking for something which else, which is some evidence of independence, yeah? And there's a lot of discussions in the panel about this independence thing, uh, but generally what happens is that we want to, we, we raise question marks if you have been a PhD student or some top researcher, and then you continue publishing most of your top papers with that top researcher who was your PhD advisor, and you have not shown that you have conducted, you know, solid research without that former PhD supervisor, then of course we start thinking maybe it's, you know, your excellent research is not really you, it's because your excellent former PhD supervisor keeps giving you like great ideas and great input into your research. So we want to see that you are capable yourself of conducting top level research. Uh, so, so do try to emphasize that if you apply, uh, you know, what independent research you have done independently of your former uh, PhD advisor, for example. Um, one thing that allows us to dispel that idea that maybe it's not you, but it's your former PhD supervisor is when you have collaborated internationally with other people and you have, you know, in different contexts with different collaborators, you have uh, published high quality research. Then we say, yes, you are capable of being put out of your, you know, initial research group and evolve. Or of course, maybe you have moved to another university and you have started your small uh, research group on your own and you know you publish without your former supervisor. That's also a way of showing independence. Um, naturally, we expect you to show very relevant expertise that contributes to your ERC project. So you have to, don't propose something in an area where you cannot show expertise and Surprisingly, we see that mistake being done often of someone proposing, I will do something um, that somehow relates to game theory. 
but their background is not really in game theory. Yeah, and then we are a bit skeptical about your ability to be able to make a breakthrough on game theory if you are coming from, if that's not exactly the main focus of your research in the past. So uh, industry experience in R&D positions is highly valuable. You know, you have been in Facebook researching one cool group that has developed some great uh, deep learning techniques for natural language processing. That is really fantastic. Um, uh, so, so, so it's a it's a big bonus, of course, and it's highly highly appreciated. So, however, you still have to have uh, the publication. So it's a little bit difficult sometimes for someone who has been purely in industrial research uh, to apply for an ERC. So, but it's excellent for an, a, a researcher who has done some academic research and then some industry research that gives it that gives a lot of plus to their, uh, uh, to their track record score. That is for the track record. So, and then a uh, second, so not only you are, you have all these characteristics, but you put together a proposal that, a research proposal that addresses a very fundamental gap that is important in a certain community of researchers and practitioners. So you have to start by describing what is this gap that you are trying to address in your research. And then you have to show that there is a clear potential gain in addressing this gap. This is what we call the high gain. It's gonna have an impact either in the research community itself, like, you know, we are gonna be able to to scale up, to develop techniques for distributed data processing in ways that we currently are not able to do. Or we will be able to construct knowledge graphs, for example, with the advances I will make in a way that is fundamentally different and more advanced than how we currently are doing it. Um, so you have to, or, you are, or there is a clear impact on, 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 on industry, on society in terms of bringing Risk fundamental research results closer to applications uh, or making some, some techniques that are currently not scalable, more scalable. So you have to show this high gain. Second, you have to show that it is, let's say, challenging to address that uh, uh, gap. That is, Related to something we call high risk that I'm gonna bring a little bit later, we, we, you have to show that there is an element of scientific risk in your proposal, that it's so challenging that you cannot just sit down, uh, especially in the field cannot just sit down uh, for a few weeks or maybe a few months and figure out how to address that gap. It really requires taking a few years of high risk research in the sense that maybe you will not be able to address that gap to an extent that makes your research, your results practical. So, so you have to walk this fine line between high, it has to be high gain and it has to be high risk. You have to, to, to spell it out, lots of gain if we solve this problem, there is a lot of scientific risk in really addressing them. But at the same time, even though it's very challenging, you have to be able to put together specific and concrete ideas on how you are going to address it, how you are gonna address this gap. Uh, and, and of course you have to describe with respect to the existing state of the art, what is the fundamental new idea the fundamental new concept, new direction that you are going to explore that is going to make a big difference uh, in this field. So, and when you describe that idea, be very concrete, concrete. Don't say, I will apply some machine learning, deep learning techniques to address a certain problem X. You know, you have to be very specific in terms of what specific machine learning techniques, what specific deep learning techniques what specific embedding, what specific encodings, um, what specific types of transformations you are going to be applying. So you have to be you know, more precise in terms of what are the theories, the algorithms that you will be exploring to address the gap. Uh, 
the set of ideas you are proposing needs to be novel, of course, and you have to have a very clear success criteria. You know, if uh, I am successful, if I can scale up to, uh, let's say, these uh, petabytes of data, for example. It is great if you can put in your proposal what we call a moonshot, which is something you will attempt to do in years three or four in terms, for example, of achieving higher scalability in terms of constructing web knowledge graph. So try to put this moonshot that will, that will, that will be like, it sounds almost impossible to achieve, but thanks to the techniques that you are addressing, it might be possible to do. So then you put that moonshot to say, I'm going to try to do this. If I do not succeed, at least I'm going to get some way to it. So very ambitious research is high risk, high gain with concrete ideas behind that make it feasible. So it has to be that if we pursue these new concepts, if you pursue these new ideas, there, are, there is a chance you will succeed. And in your research design, you have to also include some potential fallback options. Like if I am not able to apply the design new algorithms in this direction, at least I'm going to be able to you know, make some improvements to the existing techniques uh, by applying these new concepts. So in other words, you need to provide a proposal that is ambitious, high risk, high scientific risk, high gain, and that if you have a concrete idea, that if, you are, if, if it leads somewhere, it will be a breakthrough in your field. And that's what makes an ERC proposal strong, in our opinion. Um, uh, I mean, in my summary of the opinion of the panel members with whom I work. Um, I'm going to stop, and, but this is this document, which you can obtain by just, you can write me, send me an email. You can just look Marlon Dumas on Google and you'll find my email address in my web page. Send me an email. I can send you this document that I showed to you. And the document has much more than what I presented. It has ideas on how to write every one points that you might want to consider when writing each of the sections of the grant proposal uh, with advice basically coming from ERC panel chair panel member experience. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marlon. And now we'll continue with Professor Aristides Gionis. Thank you very much, Aristides, for being here with us. Uh, Professor Aristides Gionis, he is at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and he is an advanced grantee uh, of a project with the acronym Rebound. And uh, I give the floor to you. Uh, thank you, Michaela. Thank you for the invitation. Um, can you see my slides and listen to me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. So, um, as uh, Michaela said, I'm currently a professor in KTH in Sweden. I obtained my PhD in the United States from Stanford in 2003. Uh, since then, I moved to Europe. I had some experience in the industry, in Yahoo Research, uh, and then I spent uh, seven years in Aalto University, and now currently I'm, I'm in Sweden. Um, so about my research interest, I'm working on the intersection of uh, theoretical computer science and applications in data mining and data science. In particular, I focus on graph mining, um, analyzing graphs with rich information, labels, temporal graphs, sign networks, and so on, um, developing algorithms for discovering structure, different types of optimization problems, uh, analyzing uh, temporal and dynamic networks, and the focus is both on applications, but also on uh, algorithmic aspects. So my project um, is uh, acronym REBOUND, Stands is for algorithmic frame, framework for reducing bias and polarization in online media. <clears throat> so the concept is that uh, nowadays we all use online media to facilitate connectivity, personalization, democratization of content, but there are also adverse phenomena. For example, polarization, radicalization, misinformation, harassment, and so on. So in this project, we want to study computational methods 
to detect these phenomena, but also to develop mechanisms for mitigation. So uh, the project has three themes. One is the discovery theme. So how we detect patterns of bias, polarization, conflict, and so on. Exploration, how we can help users to understand the uh, global information landscape and how they can control their news feeds. And recommendations, so how we can make recommendations for users of social media to increase the diversity of content. So this is in a nutshell what my ERC project is about. Uh, so now, uh, when I am invited to, or when I ask for my uh, opinion and my experience in ERC, I'm happy to say my about my experience, but I don't have this uh, vast experience of Marlon, for example, and I cannot generalize. So I, my only experience is, is as an applicant. So I have applied two times. So one was for the Consolidator Grant in 2015, which uh, passed to the interview phase, but it did not succeed. And then I applied again for the advanced grant in 2018 that this was uh, successful. Um, so, and if you know a little bit of uh, statistics of machine learning, you know that you should not uh, kind of try to generalize from only two sample points. Uh, so I will try completely to avoid generalizations and just tell you a little bit about my own personal experience. <clears throat> so one first thing I want to say is that uh, with, respect to, with respect to the interview phase, uh, for the consolidator grant in 2015. This was a very interesting experience. It was a little bit different than what I was expecting. So I had received some advice that I should have a very polished speech and uh, up, like make it a little bit of a salesman speech appealing to, to a general audience. But uh, the interview was quite technical and more detailed. And I was very nervous, so I did not do very well, I think. Okay. Um, so another um, question, I, th I think uh, Marlon touched upon that, is uh, how one could develop a project idea for writing an application. So in my case, this was uh, in both of these uh, projects I applied, and both were different, uh, but uh, both were a logical continuation of my ongoing work at that point. Uh, so, and I, th I thought this made sense because First, uh, it was very useful to show some preliminary results and to argue about the feasibility of the, of the project, but also I had a very good understanding in depth uh, knowledge about the state of the art so I can make the project very concrete. Uh, but also uh, I try to identify uh, these uh, risky challenges that Marlon was mentioning. So I try to, to make the project more broad uh, to make it exciting. Uh, to, uh, to make it ambitious and risky. So it was a balance between these things. Um, to prepare my application, uh, I took one month uh, that I did not work on something else. I was focused on preparing and writing the proposal. Uh, and uh, this is an advice I heard, and I think I, I heard it for three months. I was not able to do that. I only took one month. And I think this is the minimum that one should spend. So I would recommend uh, putting even more time if it is possible. I know, of course, that this is not so easy to do. Another great uh, recommendation is to pitch your idea to a lot of people. So don't be silent about your project idea. Talk about that to other people. And uh, this could be both generalists. So in, if you're applying for this uh, P6, uh, general computer science who work on all types of, uh, of, uh, of areas in computer science to see how the project appeals to them, but also specialists, like uh, experts on the topic that you're applying, that they can give you very concrete information. Uh, if you pass to the second phase of the interview, a, a great idea is to uh, arrange a mock ERC panel. So, and again, this could be a panel combination of uh, generalist and specialist and in particular you may want to find uh, to add in your this mock uh, ERC panel some people who have been in a real ERC panel in the past so for example if you can get uh, Marlon it would be great okay um, what kind of support from the host institute I receive and what uh, what kind of support one should expect um, so for uh, for the application, for preparing the application, my host institute uh, was organizing different types of seminars like this one we are, we are currently and you are attending to provide all sorts of information. Uh, then 
uh, people around me, they were very happy to listen to this idea, this pitching that I, I discussed uh, before, or creating uh, mock panels. Um, also, my university uh, it has uh, research support services that can read your project very carefully and provide feedback. Uh, note that this feedback is from a project coordinator perspective. So it's, it, this, is, this is different than uh, discussing your project with, uh, with another computer scientist in your, in your area. But this could also be very useful because these people, uh, this is their job to read the uh, tens or hundreds of these projects and they know very well what to look. So I think it's not going to be kind of the fundamental aspect, but it can make perhaps your project to stand out a little bit. And of course, you can expect to receive support for preparing the budget. Uh, for, and <clears throat> for executing the project, uh, you, of course, can expect uh, and you should get support with recruitment, uh, administration, uh, like helping with managing the finances, although all the final decisions are on you, uh, helping to reporting uh, as much as they can, and, uh, and so on. Um, another note is that uh, I think this was mentioned already in, in the previous uh, panelists, so that ERC is a personal grant. So this means that the ERC grant is awarded to a researcher, to you personally, and it does not award it to the host institution. And also this means uh, that uh, you can uh, move from one institution to the other if needed. So this happened in my case. Uh, when I applied for the grant, I applied in Alta University, but uh, at almost the same time I was applying, I also took the decision to uh, move to Sweden to KTH and moving from one host institution to another, it was very easy uh, from the point of view of ERC. Uh, maybe this was uh, a little bit easier for me because I moved before the project started, but I understand that this is uh, relatively easy in, in always in any case. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, another kind of uh, very interesting experience uh, with me was uh, the process of ethical approval. Uh, so ethical aspects of the project are taken very seriously and the projects needs to have ethical approval by the ERC executive uh, authority uh, ethical board before the project starts. Uh, so this was uh, also applied to my case. So my project had uh, aspects of processing personal data, um, and there was uh, a lot of uh, requests that I had to address by the ERC ethical board. Um, and uh, for this reason, although the grant, the decision was taken in 2019, the project started in 2020, so almost uh, one year. And the reason was because the project cannot start before you complete the, uh, the ethical, you, you receive the ethical approval. Uh, on the way, I had to obtain ethical approval by the Swedish Ethical Review Authority. Um, and in general, I think on retrospect, uh, the process was not particularly difficult, but I was not experienced on this uh, with, with respect to, to these ethical aspects. Um, so it's very important to seek for proper guidance support by the host institution. So you should, for example, uh, your host institution should have uh, an ethical board and they should help uh, with, with this part of the project. Uh, overall, it was a good experience, I think. And on the way I became much more no knowledgeable and, and more confident about ethical aspects. So this was something that in the end, uh, I think I liked. Um, okay, so, and the final reflections, I conclude my presentation here. So winning an ERC is nice, let's say, not only because you obtain the funding to, uh, to follow your, um, your ideas and your project, but also uh, you are treated as a celebrity by the, by the head of the department or, or by, by the other colleagues. Um, okay, another thing to keep in mind is that you uh, suddenly are given a large amount of money to start a project. So recruitment can be di difficult. So it's a very important aspect of the project as in any project. Uh, and it can contribute significantly to the success of the project. And uh, having on ERC, I think, can make recruitment more attractive. Uh, this is mostly true for postdocs, I would say. For PhD students, uh, they are very young. They don't know at that point what ERC means. The PhD students usually, they don't know where their funding comes from. 
uh, but it can help a little bit. And the last thing I would say that one should consider is that, um, okay, uh, you suddenly given this amount of money to start your project, this is up to a five year project, and you have to build a big team to work on this project. So make sure that you apply for an idea that you are really excited. So this will help you to stay committed, uh, but also uh, try to formulate grand challenges and make the scope broad enough so that it keeps you interested in committing, committed during uh, the whole duration of the project. So don't run uh, uh, behind the latest fad, but try to find something that you are really interested in and you can really focus. Okay, and with this, I would like to conclude my presentation here. I'm happy to discuss the questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Mikaela. Thank you very much, Iris. And now we'll continue with uh, the next speaker, Professor Stefano Leonardi. Thank you very much, Stefano, for being here with us. Uh, professor Leonardi is a professor at Sapienza uh, University of Rome, and he is also an advanced grantee uh, of a project with acronym AMD Roma. So we can see your slides and we can hear you. So we are. Thank you, Michaela. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Yes, so I'm professor, uh, full professor of algorithms um, and data science at Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, my main uh, research uh, topic uh, is algorithm design. Uh, also with uh, many uh, different uh, applications. And in this specific uh, setting, uh, applications on online markets. Just a few uh, words on the main uh, rationale behind my project. Um, as all know, and actually this conference uh, was also a monetization track. So digital markets uh, nowadays are an important share of global economy. And many classical markets move to, in, move to internet and new markets uh, with previously unknown features have emerged on the internet. Uh, and many of these markets are operated by others. So that was the starting point. Uh, and therefore, uh, the main goal is the one of uh, understanding uh, the design principle of algorithms uh, and mechanisms that operate online markets. And in doing that, uh, I will uh, put, I'm putting together my favorite research topics uh, and those that are actually needed in order to address these problems, uh, that is algorithmic option mechanism design, online and approximation algorithms uh, for computational problems that are hard because many online market problems are hard problems. Um, modeling market uncertainty in algorithms and mechanisms. And finally, most of the problems are big data problems. So we like to also uh, integrate machine learning, data science, and large scale algorithmic data analysis. So, um, in uh, writing the RC project, uh, it's important uh, to outline uh, a few um, you know, important objectives. And in my project, uh, uh, the three main objectives are those of uh, design uh, new algorithm principles for auction and market design. And uh, these are specifically important because uh, uh, algorithmic problems uh, in online markets are not standard because they work on inputs that are private information on economic agents. So, so we really need to reinvent new algorithm principles, new principles for algorithm design whenever these algorithms operate digital markets. Uh, second uh, major topic uh, is the one of coping with uncertainty in all markets. So these algorithms must work uh, in uh, a scenario which is uncertain. And here we bring, we bring together a uh, classical approach of uh, uh, coping with uncertainty in economics, which is mostly the Bayesian approach with the one of computer science that uh, often adopt the pessimistic worst case approach. And in doing that, we will study you know, methods 
and uh, problems from stochastic probing, machine learning, um, and um, you know different uh, uh, methods uh, to cope with uncertainty in uh, algorithm design. Uh, finally, these uh, problems are large scale problem. So the third the main project objective is on large scale optimization, especially for uh, matching markets uh, and clustering groups. So all of this is quite familiar to the audience of the conference. Um, but, uh, and, um, you know, I will, uh, I don't uh, say more about my project. And uh, I'm actually very grateful uh, to the introduction of uh, Aris and Marlon. They you know, have already said a lot, um, very uh, important uh, points on how to uh, write and how to present an MSC project. And said that uh, I really, you know, like to add some of my experience. Uh, but also some uh, um, information, like for example, uh, the uh, consider I considered uh, quite uh, you know interesting uh, set of collaborations with my project uh, that is actually having a strong cooperation with both industry and the university, um, and uh, also of course uh, recruiting is an important component. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in uh, my project, uh, I am hiring about uh, five PhDs and five postdocs uh, for uh, three years each. So it's quite a large group uh, that uh, can be funded uh, on an advanced grant. So let me now go to the uh, main points on uh, how to uh, write and how to submit uh, 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 NERC advanced grant. So first of all, uh, I you know completely agree with Aris. Um, whenever uh, you uh, build an NERC project, uh, you should pick your favorite research topics because this will be a main commitment for five years. So uh, be sure that you really love working on the project you propose, uh, not just optim optimizing chances of success. Um, in doing that, uh, I think uh, it's of uh, great important, importance uh, also to stress uh, the uh, importance of the research goals in the current and future scientific, technological, and social development. So, which will be the impact uh, of your project on uh, science, technology, and society. Uh, and this is especially important, uh, I believe, uh, in the part, in the part uh, section D1 of the proposal. Um, in uh, drafting the research objectives, uh, try to capitalize on the uh, research excellence of your work of the last five to 10 years. Um, in um, this really good advice to see an ERC uh, project as a project that will um, frame high risk, high gain research, but uh, while departing from the current work of the PI. So clear, show clearly which is the path that brings you from the current work that you're doing from the best work that you have done in the last five, 10 years to five, ten, to five years from now in order to achieve ambitious goal. And uh, also consider that uh, you probably have to uh, reach and to update the project during its development. So uh, by adding the research directions, uh, our field changes very quickly. And five years is a very long time in our field. So it's very likely that your uh, research goals will move, will shift, will be updated, uh, of course, because of you, the work also that you are doing. And so make it uh, broad enough in a way that can be uh, enriched with new research directions. 
For example, in my case, uh, I am now addressing more and more the problems uh, of algorithmic fairness and transparency in uh, digital markets. Um, writing and presentation of the proposal. Um, so uh, I think something that is important is also to draw inspiration from the structure of successful proposals of uh, close colleagues. Um, in general, I found uh, colleagues very happy to share uh, with the applicants their success proposals. Um, of course, you know, you are doing something entirely different, uh, but uh, I learned a lot by reading successful proposals of um, you know, close uh, colleagues. Secondly, I completely agree that one shouldn't be afraid to share and discuss the main ideas of the proposal as much as possible and ask advice to estimated colleagues. It's also a very good suggestion, the one of uh, uh, asking advice not only to colleagues uh, working on your own research field, but also colleagues uh, that work on uh, broad you know, other fields of computer science, uh, also because, you know, the panel, uh, the RC panel uh, is composed by colleagues from all different fields of computer science and information systems. Regarding the uh, timeline, uh, uh, yes, uh, take a fair amount of time, but most importantly, plan to complete a first draft of the proposal at least two months in advance, uh, because uh, you will uh, make a lot of changes after your proposal will be sent for review to your colleagues and collaborators. So it's a very good idea to uh, plan to uh, complete a first draft of the proposal, especially the first part, uh, at least two months in advance. Uh, you might like to change it a lot after you get the feedback of your collaborators and colleagues. I mean, with respect to uh, the type of project that uh, one is presenting, I think uh, it's uh, important uh, to stress uh, the uniqueness of the scientific profile of API and the differences uh, with uh, other, you know, successful. Uh, scientist in the field, meaning that uh, uh, you really like to explain why the PI is the most suitable person to carry on the specific uh, research project. Um, I think it's really important to think uh, where you can make the difference, where you are the person that is most suitable to uh, accomplish a specific uh, work. So those are the main, my, you know, recommendations. Uh, and what happens when you get a grant and you start a project? Uh, recruiting is the most important part, perhaps at least at the beginning. So start recruiting PhDs and postdocs uh, two, three months before the beginning of the project because this takes a while. Um, recruit, of course, with international open calls and offer competitive salaries at European level. Um, I think uh, it's important, and Miguel already told us uh, that there are many instruments uh, for doing that, uh, to enrich the project by funding collaborations with colleagues and students from other institutions, to organize meetings and scientific exchanges at all levels. Um, so, uh, dissemination and outreach outside the scientific community, this is very valuable, and uh, it's uh, an opportunity that is often offered to uh, ERC um, grantees uh, to speak in uh, uh, forums where uh, uh, students, uh, scientists, uh, and uh, even uh, you know journalists uh, from you know outside uh, your own research field uh, can listen to you. So uh, this must be organized and this takes time, but I think it's a very valuable and uh, it's uh, something that you probably, one, you know, that one is 
needs to learn and then needs to devote some time. And the ethical aspects are also very important. I am not being so, uh, you know, I, I also had uh, to work a lot on the ethical, aspect, the ethical aspects on my project. And, and then I think it's a very good idea to appoint an ethical advisor before the beginning of the project that uh, will uh, review your project. So it's not enough uh, to, of uh, course, host institution might help, but the data protection officer of the host institution is often uh, you know, overwhelmed with a lot of work. So having a professional ethical, ethical advisor that uh, will uh, appointed uh, at the time of, of the writing of the proposal uh, could be a good idea. And this person will also follow and uh, you know, will advise uh, during the whole uh, um, Finally, uh, well, let me comment on the major impact of having an EOC grant. Um, so you should, I think one should see this uh, not as a point of arrival, but a springboard. And uh, I think it's good to start thinking very soon of what will come next, because uh, there will be a lot of work that will be done uh, with the ERC and many other, many ideas will come. And I think it's good to start thinking, uh, you know, what next after the ERC? Perhaps not in the first year, not in the second year, but I think already at the third year, it's good to start to see, to think of what will be the next uh, step of your research. So uh, I found it uh, very important that the ERC allows to establish a center of excellence in the field that can attract additional national and international funding. So there are more opportunities that come together with ERC. And also gives bigger visibility across a research discipline, especially at the host institution. So it gives a chance to talk to scientists of other fields. And then uh, it's good to devote some resources to foster an interdisciplinary research and communication with scientists on other fields. And finally, I think uh, perhaps uh, this is the most important point. Uh, so the postdocs and the PhDs that will work on ERC project are the natural candidates for the future ERC. ERC. And then uh, it's uh, important to offer them the chance to become independent and creative scientists. So that uh, the training done during the ERC will uh, actually be the uh, for, will form the basis for uh, you know uh, future applicants. Thank you very much. That's all I have to do. Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for their contributions. Uh, I think uh, they are very useful for the interested. Uh, uh, scientists that they would like to apply and uh, maybe you can stop sharing Stefano your Sorry? slides maybe you can stop sharing the slides oh sure of course and uh, now maybe we can ask uh, for questions from the participants if there are any questions you can write in the chat but you can also uh, speak and ask Pierre? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, I was more curious about the, the second part of the application process because there is some kind of interview, or at least an audition, where you get in front of a jury. So I, I was curious about what is actually expected there. Is it just the ability of the candidate to defend his project, or is the jury kind of try to really get into the technical thing? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand exactly what is expected of, of that part of the, of the process. Well, the second part, yes, involves interviews. Uh, in total is uh, around 25 minutes, the interview. Uh, that is part of it is the presentation by the applicant and the rest is the Q&A. So the exact time of uh, the presentation is defined by the panel. So it can be 10 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, okay. but uh, usually most of the panels, they prefer to give more time to the Q&A. So, uh, 
our advice is the presentation is a presentation of your project and uh, why you are the best person uh, to implement this project. But uh, you have to know that uh, the panel members, they have uh, read your proposal many, many times and they are very well aware of your project. So you don't need to spend a lot of time to uh, you have to focus on uh, the 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 high risk high gain aspect of your project uh, maybe why you are the most suitable person to execute this project so mostly to to emphasize to this and give an overview of your project and then uh, you will have the chance to the q a to answer uh, the specific questions that might be more technical or it might be also for the resources part they must ask you about the collaborations that you have mentioned uh, in the proposal. I don't know if the other speakers they would like, or Aris, uh, you would like to to say something for your experience. Yes. Um, well, I think this to summarize very well. I think uh, uh, also Pierre, you. This is what you said. You should, you are expected to defend your proposal, and I think you should be prepared to answer all sorts of questions. It could be technical. It could be on the implementation part, on the recruitment, on funding, anything. So, I think yes, I don't think there are limitations. Yeah, so it's basically convincing the, the person, like the person in front of you, that okay, everything that you wrote, you can defend and, and justify and say, okay, I, I've thought about this, and, and this is why you should fund my project to, to be able to convince my reason. Mm -hmm. but if, Yes, and why is novel? Why is different? Why is it um, uh, an, an important project to fund? And maybe since um, 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 can I ask a question? Like, is there any feedback after? Like, if so if I get rejected, do you, can you ask for feedback in some way, or can you get some feedback somehow? Or maybe what were the weaknesses of your project, or is it something that's completely all back? Or I don't know how to say that. No, no, you receive feedback. In case uh, a proposal is not successful from step one to step two, you receive feedback. So you receive all the written reviews uh, by the panel members that they reviewed uh, your proposal. And also you receive the panel comment that is the collegial decision of the panel. So you receive the panel comment that is uh, one, two paragraphs uh, summarizing the decision and also the individual comments. And at step two, uh, if you pass at step two and uh, you don't get funded, you also receive all the feedback from panel members and also remote reviewers and the panel comment again. So you have all the feedback. So this is also very useful in case uh, a proposal is not successful to, to consider and uh, yeah, and improve your proposal for the next time. And is it expected like people get it on the first try or it's mostly on the second or so try that people get it or it really depends on the candidate and the project? I don't, I don't know if you have, there are any statistics on that. Or... No, I, I think, as I said, the statistics that we have, especially for starting and consolidator grandees, and uh, it might happen that some people, they get it uh, from the first uh, okay. try, some others no. Uh, but that's why the suggestion is not to wait if you are, let's say, in the starting run uh, phase, uh, the suggestion is not to wait too, too much, to be close to the end, to the seven years, uh, because in case you are not successful, then you will go to the next uh, level, to the consolidator grant. Yeah. So maybe it's better that you have the chance to reapply to the same type of grant. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't mention, uh, but all the information you can find uh, in our website, in the work program, but also information for applicants. Uh, there is uh, different information for applicants for study, consolidate, or in advance. And uh, there are also some cases that this eligibility window can be extended. In case of maternity leave, paternity leave, uh, there are uh, specific uh, cases where with documentation you can extend this eligibility window. So if, if I may, some, may say something, I don't know if this is accurate, but perhaps the concept of applying for a second time, like I get it by the second time, is not even very well defined because uh, you receive the grant as a PI and as a project. So when you apply again, you apply with a different project. So it might be a completely different, or it might be that you decided to make some uh, improvements. 
So it's not so clear what does it mean. You get it, but of course I, I know what you mean. But just to to, to be more precise. Yeah. Actually, this is a very good comment because what we uh, what is uh, the practice in the ERC is that each proposal is evaluated as a new proposal. So there is no memory of previous proposal. This is more for you, <laughs> but uh, for us there is no memory. They don't have access uh, if it's a reapplication or not. The panel members when they evaluate. Yeah, okay. this is a, that's a very good point. Thank yeah, you, Alice. Well, thanks a lot for, for, for the answer. Is there another question? So, hi, uh, thank, thank you for the advice. So I think this is going to be helpful, probably mostly for me next year. Um, but so maybe a question to, to Aris and Stefano specifically, you said uh, the advice was take a block of time and reserve it for writing the proposal. And this is obviously quite a lot of bigger than the, the typical small proposal. So how did you end up structuring that time to work on that? So kind of what was the approach? So uh, um, I will say that I, start, I personally started from the part B1, from the five pages. Um, so that took a lot of time. So the second part uh, comparison, uh, so it's longer, but uh, it's often a you know, development and extension. Uh, state of the art uh, and uh, detailed research objectives of the first uh, part, B1. So I think I would, uh, I personally started uh, from uh, the first part. And then uh, as long as I completed the first part, I sent it for review to a bunch of people. I already started to work on the second part, you know, hoping that uh, the material, the, most of the material could be retained. I must say that I did uh, quite a lot of changes after the, the reviews and the comments that I received. And yeah, and in any case, I think it's, from well, repeat, it's good idea to finish at least, you know, a couple of months in advance in a way that, uh, you know, uh, there's still time to bring changes and uh, restructure. Certainly, I think it's a good idea to understand which are the main uh, research objectives. So that's that could help. Um, you know, could be that the part B one, uh, in some sense, uh, um, so part B two is an extension of part B one that retains the same structure. That I would say it's option one, right? So part B1, uh, it's a kind of summary with uh, additional um, high-level view and motivation of the, your work. And then uh, part B2, it's, uh, you know, will detail uh, the work that you're planning to. That's option number one. But I also see a different approach that part B1 and part B2 was very different. And uh, so part B1 is really, trying to highlight uh, which are the big challenges in the area and why you are, uh, in, you know, up and how you plan to uh, address these big challenges. And then part B2 is more technical. So in some sense, you know, I would say that uh, that's a second option. It's also, I think, excellent. So part B1 is really for a, a uh, good for, uh, um, you know, it's accessible to scientists uh, in a whole computer science. Part B2 is more technical and maybe more accessible to the viewers who are here. In my case, I think uh, it was important. I, I started by the blueprint, like thinking how to organize the yeah, the research questions, the objective, the what exactly you want to do, something you know that can fit at the back of the envelope. And this can take a long time because you need to read a lot. And after that, 
uh, I think apply, this applies to, to writing in general, not only for proposals, but for pay. Then you start writing like blindly and then you fill in some text and then you need to do many iterations. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sorry, I also assume that before start writing, you really have, you think for several months what to do in your mind. <laughs> That's for sure, you know, <laughs> and you read a lot. I mean, I was really talking about the writing, how to organize everything. <laughs> it's something that will be, you know, it's in your mind for many months and then, yeah. That's why I said it's mostly relevant for me next year. Thank you very much. I also see that we had a question in the chat. I replied, uh, in case the proposal, I am also saying, uh, in case a proposal at step one receives a B or a C, there are uh, restrictions for reapplying for one and two years. So you have to wait one year if you get a B at step one, uh, two years if you get a C at step one for reapplying. Uh, but if your proposal makes it uh, at step two, there are no restrictions you can apply the, the next year. These restrictions are mentioned uh, to the work program it's here. So with this, I think we are 3.30. I would like to thank you all for attending this session and a uh, special thanks to uh, the invited speakers that they provided very useful suggestions. Uh, Ahmad, would you like to make a very quick comment? I see, ah, no, it's uh, only, yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, thank you also.